Welcome to Barn Blog, and we continue our journey into the intersection of philosophy, politics, and science, more philosophy and science and politics, but this time in biology. And with me today is Viv Soni, who's a postdoc at Arizona State University, who works in population genetics, genomics, biology, a bunch of things that um, I'm probably insulting people by conflating, but we'll we'll find out. Um, this is the field of science that I feel most comfortable in uh, when you get like you gave me a paper and I understood it all, including the methodology section, where if someone gives me some of the physics and math papers, I'm like, I'm not bad at math, but this is I don't know what this means. Um, <laughs> I, th I think maybe in part that's because like a lot of stuff in population genetics uh, has moved towards simulation because you can't solve a lot of these problems analytically anymore. So in that sense, it's almost more accessible. Yeah. And I have a, you know, we were, we were joking about how I have a humanities graduate degree, but way back in the deep past, I have an anthropology background and it was forensic more than um, forensic and historical, more than cultural. So, you know, I played with DNA and bones um, in undergrad. And so it's not foreign to me when we talk about like nucleotides and whatnot and the and like how uh, the molecular research work. Now, it's foreign to me if you were to ask me to do it. Um, that's a completely different thing. Uh, I dated a PhD in organic chemistry for a while and was always amazed at like what she worked in the private sector and like what she was playing with. And I was like, yeah, I'd be afraid to touch that even with equipment. Like I might burn a hole in something or. Oh yeah. We're um, exclusively dry lab, like computational. I, I, I um, yeah, I'm absolutely no good in a wet lab. <laughs> yeah. 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 The dry lab conditions versus wet lab conditions are fun. Um, I, uh, I have not been in either in a long, long time, but today we're talking about the philosophy around biology and its relationship to analytic and dialectic thinking. And one of the things that I wanted to do, because biology is one of these, one of these areas where at first glance, no one's going to expect that there's been an analytic dialectic debate under in methodology for about half a century um and it's not framed exactly in those terms uh today but if you know the history going back to haldane etc there is a lot of you know influence of things that i thought were basically cult text um until very recently um and we'll get into that and you know we might talk about things like dialectics of nature or whatever towards the end but in what ways is something like uh genomics and population genetics informed by philosophical assumptions i know i know, you know it's not supposed to be in theory but it seems very much like it is and i want to get into maybe why before we go into the nitty-gritty yeah, I mean, I think population genetics was a battleground from like it's when it first like became a field, um, partly partly simply because of the actual like positions of like the sort of main like founders of the field. You mentioned Haldane himself. I know you've talked about Haldane previously. Um, obviously, a communist. There was like there's like a rich um, like Marxist tradition within population genetics and it was interesting how many of them reacted to like what they saw as like the degradation of the um, Russian revolution um, and of course you also have um, like a strong um, eugenics um, strand running through population genetics like um, Ronald Fisher is like a f one of the main founders um, of population genetics um, a huge figure within statistics in general, and obviously he he was a eugenicist, and like there's still 
like an ongoing debate that crops up every now and then. It's it's laying latent for a long time, um, just sort of under the surface, but it seems to be coming out more and more now where, um, for example, um, you'll have students. Um, there was recently a, um, a review published about uh, Ronald Fisher and students at um, Edinburgh University were trying to... Um, I think they were trying to revoke um, Brian Charlesworth. He's like a, um, um, I can't remember the phrase for it, professor when you've been forced to retire, but you basically still got an office. Um, mm -hmm. he's, and he's em like, uh, Emeritus. That's the one, yeah. And he's he's probably the um, most prolific population ethicist still alive. And they were trying to revoke that. And so these debates are still kind of like live. Uh, so, I mean, I think part of it is um, where it comes from, but also it's like a foundational um, field in terms of biology. Everything's kind of informed by population genetics. So uh, you mentioned previously, obviously, you've got a background in anthropology. Um, and even that sort of when you when you draw it back, you're working with like understanding like the genetic component there. Um, right. so and also something that has a strong history and questionable science. Uh, related to the British Empire, and then, um, I mean, if if you look at what like the forensic anthropology that she's po police, um, is based on 19th century race science, and it's still used. Like yeah. it's it's kind of crazy, actually. <laughs> well, this is the thing. Like the political element is always there. Um, in mm. terms of like, uh, it, it's not very far removed in terms of actual application, and so, I mean, often like you can. Uh, you can kind of avoid these debates if you want to, but they are very much there and they're very much alive. Hmm. So, we, we, so we have this mixed history of population genetics. We have a strong ties to eugenics and we have this other end of its understanding in the classical socialist movement. And, you know, I've talked about Haldane. Now, I've only talked about Haldane from the, oh, isn't it interesting that uh, the guy who figured out how to make Mend Mendelian and Darwinian genetics work was a uh, was a communist who was trying to who was trying to like vindicate dialectics of nature. It was also a spy, but um, which is you know so that's cool in 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 the well you don't normally get a lot of cool movies about. Uh, uh, population geneticist and 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 uh, people messing around in labs, and you could with Haldane, although probably don't. It probably hasn't been made because it makes the other side look good. But um, it, it's interesting because I think people assume that dialectical notions of biology uh, always degenerate into Lamarckianism at best or Lysenkoism at worst. And yes, Virginia, there is a difference, although uh, it's uh, of the historical importance of that difference is kind of only pedantically interesting to, to Marxist. Um, but, and I also want to state that like, when we say oh, eugenicist, there's also a whole lot of Marxist eugenicists. Unfortunately, it's not like they were totally, uh, eugenics w until World War II was, I'm not going to say value neutral, but it was a contested terrain at, which had right, left, and center figures. So um, it's not like you have Nazi race science on one end and Stalinist biology on the other. It's a lot more complicated than that. Um, but I know that from the historical point of view. And... I also know that in the popular imagination about um, population genetics, it kind of didn't get talked a lot about in, in popular sources in biology for the past 25 years, even during the New Atheist period, because the selfish gene thesis, uh, which is and and all that was taken as given. Um, and that was how it was communicated to the semi, semi science literate public. So that's how it was taught to laymen. Uh, people remember the battles between, uh, Stephen Jay Gould and, um, 
Richard Dawkins in the 90s because they're both very active literary figures. But the actual state of the science was actually not portrayed very well by the communicators of biology, I think, in general. Like, I just remember being surprised, for example, how long it took pop culture to realize that epigenetics was a thing. Um, and um, gene triggers were a thing. And population triggers were a thing. And these are things that I had heard about vaguely. They were cutting edge science when I had studied in the aughts. They were still very new. But even as an undergrad, they were at least mentioned to me. And that was not mentioned in the popular debate. But that's how a lot of people were exposed to this. Um, now, all this is to kind of frame. Uh, what are people's basic misconceptions of population genetics before we kind of like... So we ha we have this... This is this history that I don't think most people know. Um, but at a very basic level, when someone when you're talking to someone, when you're having, I don't know if you drink or not, if you have tea or beer, depending on it, your particular inclinations, maybe coffee, I don't know. Um, and they ask you about what you do, what do they misunderstand about it? Okay, so um, firstly, just um, just because otherwise I'll get grief if I don't correct this. Uh, like the synthesis between um, Mendelian inheritance and Darwinism, um, you could say it's Haldane, but it probably started with Morgan, um, okay. who uh, first discovered the chromosome, and then you have Fisher, you have Sewell Wright, and um, Haldane, um, and it kind of all comes together through those figures. Um, but yeah, so at, um, like. I'll, I'll come back around to the question, but like the selfish gene was how I first um, became interested in um, evolutionary biology myself. Um, and so this is before I had any kind of um, real um, background in like socialist politics or anything. And I found the like adaptationist paradigm extremely accessible. It, it's just very intuitive um, and you can see the appeal of it. Um, mm -hmm. And I think um, it was actually like, I think at that point I started um, reading Marx and then you sort of start see, start seeing um, some of these very kind of like, um, like reductionist relationships within um, adaptationism and looking for alternatives. Um, and so I think those, um, like there was like a strong body of work by people like um, Richard Lewontin, Stephen Jay Gould, who you mentioned, um, like refuting um, I, like adaptationist thinking um, and sociobiology as well, but it didn't break into the mainstream in the same way. Uh, Selfish Gene was just like an unprecedented success. Um, and even... Um, it, it accidentally formed whole fields of what ended up being pseudoscience. Like, Yeah, absolutely. I mean... No, uh, some of that. Talking about memetics for people yeah. who know what... But like, memetics is something that we only now have left over to us from the use of memes on the internet. But I remember from like the late 90s until about, I don't know, a decade ago, people were trying to make that a science so that all social science would mimic um, adapt adaptationist views of biology, which was wild to me given other things they were rejecting, but it was complete. It ended up being a pseudoscience. And I say ended up because I'm not going to fault the people who were pursuing it as a research question uh, for the first, you know, for the first decade or so, because you have to falsify it. But that said, I always thought about that paradigm and go and just and I thought even conceptually, it never made sense to me just from an analytic standpoint, like, like, OK, so you're treating idea sets as if they are adaptations like viruses and you're calling that more scientific, but it's based on a metaphor. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I, there's no clearly <laughs> defined research program there. Right. Um, and I, I get I, I mean whether you buy into falsification as like your demarcation or not, um, there is very, there isn't really a way of falsifying um, memetics. Um, but to come, yeah, sorry. go ahead. Go ahead. Um, just to come back to your other question. When I uh, tell most people 
what I do. I, I honestly, I don't think there is um, like a high level of awareness of the field in general. Still, like if you have, uh, interestingly, people on the left tend to have slightly more awareness, mostly because of Engels and his influence on Lewington Levin's dialectical biologists and stuff like that. Um, but again, it's more an interest in terms of where you can have a justification of dialectics in cutting edge science as opposed to um, maybe like uh, an interest in the field per se. It's just, I mean, I, I call it vindicating daddy Ingalls. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, but I mean, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that. There's a lot of that in anthropology too. people trying to vindicate things and, um, and uh, the origins of what is it? Ingalls' anthropological work, whose whose exact titles left me at the moment, but it's something of the origins of the family, oh, yeah. uh, um, and dialectics of nature, uh, where you know, and I've had I've had people very very articulately try to tell me that uh, that the arguments about the hand, which are completely Lamarckian, are are not Lamarckian, even though they are. Um, and that epigenetics vindicates them, even though I've gone into there are there is literature that uses uh, Lamarck. Um, there's scientific literature that talks about how epigenetics seems tied into Lamarckian thought, but most people who work in the field will tell you they're separate theories. Um, yeah, um, epigenetics can be explained within like modern population genetics without it, it doesn't question the paradigms that are being worked with currently and i think as you mentioned with lamarckism you have this kind of um it, it's it, i think there's like a tendency and it's the same within science it's the same within most fields where um whether it's coining new terms or develop, like selling new paradigms you, there'll be like an overstatement of what something is um so uh, there's um evolution in four dimensions that, that that book very much does this in terms of um, epigenetics as well it's ultimately it has a um, genetic component that can explain this right I mean I love that book evolution of four dimensions but I did go back and I was like I don't like the fact that it talks about this in terms of indicating elements of Lamarckism because I'm like it's going to confuse people as to what's actually going on here I mean for those who don't know ed epigenetics uh is about the way i guess the way environmental triggers and env and past environment can create through basically protein or our molecular noise different triggers that you know can pass down down generations based on the life experience of the parents the the, the, the biggest one is like um the children of people who uh survive famines or who were poor and who had little food access that, that that their children tend to be more obese because for whatever reason they tend to attract gut flora that's more efficient and blah 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 like that's that's like that that's the example you hear in the news <laughs> um um you know as one of the explanations to why people who are impoverished tend to have children who are overweight um you know there are other explanations that are just as sensible though like um I don't know. We make high fat, high carb food cheap. There's not enough time for exercise, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and all that plays into our understandings of things like human biology. Um, but yeah, I, I, I also find that people, they, they, they don't know it. Um, they don't know population genetics. They also, there's a sub, there's a different section of the left, I think, that also just wants to throw it entirely out. Um, uh, this is the the Foucauldian influence blank slate people who just do not want to believe there's any biological influence on yeah. on human beings. Now, those people are are becoming rarer, at least in Marxist circuit circles. They were more con when I moved in anarchist circles in, in my teens, they were pretty common. Um, and occasionally you meet Foucauldians who are like this too, who just basically deny there's any um, 
they take a John Locke and Tabula Rasa view of what it means to be a person. And if there is biological influences, they're so negated by social influences that it's not used to talk to them. And I'm just like, well, but how does your medicine work then? Like antibiotics. Anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so what is the what is the state of play here? Why why is population genetics such a challenge to the adaptionist model? Let's let's start with that question, kind of going into the specifics. Um, well, I mean, the adaptationist model would be, I mean, it's it's it, it's within population genetics. So, I mean, there are plenty of adherence to it within the field. Um, the the kind of I guess the debate still goes on and a part of it comes down to um, in terms of how it looks now is um, can be explained by modeling. So if you mm -hmm. think about um, how like there are so many complex forces acting on a um, like on a population at the genetic level, um, if you think in evolutionary time, um, you've got to account for demographic change, you've got to account for recombination rates, mutation rates. Um, a purifying selection which is the removal of um, deleterious uh, variation um, and to actually before you can actually understand whether any positive selection is happening so any uh, beneficial mutation that will occur in the population and then sweep through the population um, you need to be able to account for these forces now that's that's not a simple thing to do this is like complicated and time consuming um, and uh, for a long time what has been popular is genome scans, where what you do is you look, you have your population genetic data, numerous individuals, you have various summary statistics, you scan across the genome and you look for outliers and you look at the outliers and you say, oh, here's something interesting. And depending on the statistic, you can say, oh, positive selection is happening here. Now, the problem with that is you're not accounting for all the forces I just mentioned. You're not accounting for variability within across the actual genome. Um, but um, it is an easy way to get papers published because it's a much it's a much more straightforward way of doing things as opposed to so the paper I sent you discusses the fact that for each um, each population that you have sampled DNA from, you kind of need to develop a null model for that population accounting for all these forces. That's laborious work. It takes simulation. It takes resource. It takes time. Um, and so you kind of have the field very much butting heads with like the state of science under capitalism right now, um, under like how funding is actually um, like the funding model for science. So obviously, like, especially for like early career researchers, um, getting as much funding as possible is key. And to get that funding, you need papers. Um, and so doing like the laborious hard work is obviously a less appealing um, shift from the mindset where you can do things like these genome scans. Now that's kind of um, where the kind the adaptationist um, debate still rages on. So it's and and part of it does um, like it's the nature of it is almost like a miscommunication where um, anti-adaptationist thinkers um, will show that the majority of evolution is happening. Um, either through genetic drift or through purifying selection. That's that removal of deleterious variation. Um, and you'll have adaptationists arguing, but no, that's not the case at the phenotypic level. So you have um, w one argument from the genotypic level and one from the phenotypic, and no one's arguing that at the phenotypic level, most um, evolution isn't happening adaptively. Um, the debate kind of rages on in that sense. Now, it, the adaptationist paradigm, the way someone like Richard Dawkins um, talked about it was, you can look at an organism, for example, and you can um, look at its uh, behavior, its physiology, its morphology, and you can infer something about it from that. And that's how mm -hmm. you develop your hypotheses and go from there. Um, but what you end up with is like everything's kind of back to front because you rather than looking um, 
but rather than having some sort of null model and trying to see what's going on, what you're doing is you're starting with, that's what I'm looking for. And this was what Lewington and Levins were heavily critiquing in the dialectical biologist. Um, and I think their use of dialectics was, uh, it was, it, I, I, I'm a fan of that, that work, partly because, and it's, maybe it's a sleight of hand, but what they do is they shift from Engels, who very much talks about laws, to almost like this is a framework. Um, so just kind of rowing that back slightly. And I think if you're talking to um, biologists, um, it, it's, it's actually been a, a really influential and useful uh, work. Yeah, I, I think I became somewhat aware of this work a little bit through the popularizations of David Sloan Wilson and his later debates with um, uh, with with Dawkins in the public sphere. But I know he was also actively doing research, um, and that led me to Lewinton and uh, back to Gould. I've been familiar with Gould as a as a teenager, because that's when he was like writing articles for the New York times. I mean, like, you know, um, but I actually grabbed the structure of, of evolutionary theory, which was a kind of breakthrough text for me thinking about why it was important to model this stuff uh, on scale and why that is actually also kind not to reduce it to a philosophical debate. I, I hate when like philosophers of science do that, but there are philosophical assumptions one has to make um, when one is setting up models. Um, and I think you're right that there are, it's not just that adaptionism, you know, has a long pedigree and it seems very explanatory immediately, but it also is easy to fund. Um, but it leads to weird things. Uh, you know, for example, my favorite weird ones are like people who use adaptionist modalities for things like evolutionary psychology, which is, you know, um, uh, if you know, everyone laughs and, and everyone's like evolutionary psychology must be true. And I've always been like, as a base assumption, it probably like the, its impulses, its initial statement is, but uh, it's basing weird stuff on adaptions and it literally works backwards from observation to trying to find a genetic marker that would clearly instigate that and then read that back onto the population level um which is and without recourse to comparative biology and what i mean by that is like if you look at the the analogs to humans like when you, if you study behavioral genetics in animals right um, if you look at the analog, the human, and this is not for you, Viv, this is for our audience. Um, you know that, um, you need comparative species who have, who have similar DNA to start making, you know, causal analysis. Well, in humans, a lot of times, uh, we have special pleading between people picking chimps and people picking bonobos and then trying to find a, a gene marker for it and then making wild claims about social behavior um, based off of, off of this. And we don't have enough comparative species for that to be meaningful. And often the chimps and bonobos have different traits. Like if you were to map them out on the, on the trait level um, you would see that like, okay, well, sexual aggression and possessiveness versus uh, sex as a, uh, a social glue uh, map completely differently on, and, and those are the closest two species to us, blah, 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 blah. Um, and I, I bring that up because when you start looking at population genetics, you realize, well, this, yeah, this basic supposition about behavior in context of sociality may be useful that you guys are making in, um, in, evolutionary psychology but you're going about it the entirely wrong way we should be looking at genetic drift we should be looking at things that we can model and then seeing if there's any correlation 
uh, to this in the environment. And instead of talking about broad generalizations about things that are going to always be true based off of suppositions from the African savannah or some shit like that, you should be looking at like, well, what are the immediate population things? What are the environmental triggers? What would cause noise in the in the gene database, et cetera? So that's why this is important for communicating this to the public, right? But I feel like that's completely botched. And you can say if I botched it too, because it's not easy to talk about. Well, this is exactly what sociobiology did as well, where you started with, you um, look at like current hierarchies that exist and current traits that exist within humans, and then you extrapolate that that's human nature. Um, and so again, it's that adaptationist thinking where you start from what is and then you turn that into something, you you naturalize that. Um, and I mean, sociobiology had some great communicators. Um, so uh, E.O. Wilson, of course, is extremely famous. Um, again, another one who Lewontin was back and forth, I think, called as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, this stuff isn't, uh, the problem is, it's not intuitive. Um, it's, and and uh, what, what, so- It's also example, not single vector. Like that's yes. another problem. Yeah. So it's not intuitive because it's not single vector. We have yeah. to look at things that are uh, that seem overdetermined, and I mean that in the logical sense, people, not in the Althusserian <laughs> sense. Before my audience goes all Althusserian on me, um, I, I mean that there's so many things that could be a causal factor that figuring out the causal factor, we don't have any clear way to to do a singular determination, right? And that's uh, it, and what I found fascinating is I, you know, it seems like genetics, there's only so many peptides, right? Like it wouldn't, and there's only so many uh, phenotypes and there's only so many ways it's going to play in the genome. And yet the more I learn about it, the more I realize that this shit's infinitely complicated because there's interactions with things that we, th that we call, for example, junk DNA. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, we don't know so, what junk DNA actually is, and it's probably not junk. Like... Yeah, some of the most interesting stuff is going on in non-coding regions, and humans have like huge non-coding regions. Um, but the other issue is that ultimately, what you can do is it's not you can you can confirm you cannot confirm a model. All you can do is reject the wrong models, because ultimately, with your data, you will always be able to fit multiple models um, to your data. So how do you choose between them? Like you have some ability to, but we have no confidence in which one. So for example, you might have um, um, like uh, most populations have um, gone through severe bottlenecks. So you have like, for example, with the out of Africa hypothesis, you have a bottleneck when um, a population migrated. So obviously it's much smaller, um, the migrating population. And so you have a founder effect where that you have a much smaller um, gene pool within that migrating population um, before it expands um, when it's migrated. Um, now that that has a similar um, genetic footprint to um, like rapid adaptive evolution. Now that's just a very simple example, but when you have all these forces um, at play, oh. um, how do you how do you just how can you identify the right one? So ultimately what it comes down to is you can reject models and you can say here are my hundreds potentially thousands of models that do fit the data we can't tell which one's the right one which creates a rather bleak picture for the future of the field but that's kind of where we're at at the moment so for yeah so for example if we have punctuated equilibrium or if we have the population bottleneck and what the mitochondria dna thesis right that there's uh, six strands of mitochondrial DNA and four of them are in Africa and two of them are everywhere else. And therefore that's the other, like the other bit of data we use to correlate that, but it might also be correlated with other shifts in, in population. And we're just not considering, like I haven't heard punctuation and equilibrium really brought up a whole lot since Boole died, honestly. Um, and I felt like that was one where, where um uh <laughs> where it really was almost a, a a coon effect of well Dawkins won because in the popular imagination just because Gould was dead and there was nobody as eloquent to defend it to the public 
And so the paradigm sort of gets shelved for a while um, until it kind of gets picked up a little bit. And and I, when I when I see it mentioned now, it's like in footnotes on alternate explanations of of like gene shifts that we see, right? Yeah, I mean, the rate of evolution, which is ultimately what that debate was about, um, is still some. I, I, I guess the problem is the field doesn't have those great communicators anymore. So there's like definitely a distinction between like how much public awareness there is of stuff and then um, like research in the field. Um, it's, I, th I think it's, it's hard to, the other thing I, I guess we really should be discussing is that you had this like, um, sequencing revolution that happened and so mm -hmm. when we had like people like um, Lewontin, um, uh John Maynard Smith, um, Gould, um, at the, they, uh, many of them they didn't have the data so what you had was you had a field that was theoretically miles ahead of the actual empirical research because the, the data simply didn't exist. Then you had the sequencing revolution and there are floods and floods of data available now. And so everyone just, it, it, I mean, it became the Wild West ultimately because everyone's doing genome scans, what have you. Um, but suddenly theory started to lag behind again. Um, and again, part of this is, I, I touched on it earlier, how um, because we have all this data, you can't solve many of these problems analytically. Um, it becomes too complicated too quickly. And so what you do is forward simulation. Now this is literally brute force. You move forward a generation, you do the calculations based on theory, you move to the next generation, you do this over 100,000 100, generations, several replicates, blah, 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 blah. Um, and suddenly it becomes very easy to, in a way, it becomes easy to do population genetics, but it what doing population genetics well means kind of goes out of the window. Um, and I think to some extent, whilst that sort of theoretical side when you're talking about things like punctuated equilibrium um, has kind of gone by the wayside. What you've had is like a flood of um, you'll have like within the popular um, imagination with uh, like you'll have media articles in the newspapers and things about, oh, um, we've discovered the genetic basis for such and such a trait and such and such an organism. Right. I remember the Holy Grail back back twenty years ago was looking for, for example, like the gene that made people homosexual or not, mm -hmm. um, and those kinds of things. Um, and you know, luck, luckily, a lot of those, a lot of those uh, searches for simple behavior causes and gene markers or simple are are in, in gene pairs has kind of dropped. Um, not entirely and the ones that we do know about are often way more complicated than are initially understood like my, my, the one that i bring up a lot is like aggression well apparently there's there's like protein chains and the actual experience of trauma from uh from like leftovers from adrenaline <laughs> that can tr that can like make this one gene marker trigger aggression but if you never have a traumatic instance you're actually more just statistically predisposed to be less aggressive so that even calling it a gene for aggression is a misnomer it's like a a marker for for an aggressive response to trauma um and that's just one that i know about from like recent research but like every time we're flooded with this information um and i have found you know i know this is like a computer science uh like cliche but you know you have data and then you have information and information is when you have data which you can narrativize and theorize and data is just i don't know data you just got info and i feel like in after the gene map mapping revolution there was, a, there was a lot of there's a lot of big claims made and there was a lot of dropping of theory and a lot of those big claims haven't panned out actually it, because the the actual mechanism ends up being far more complicated than immediately thought, even in things that seem simple on, on like the phenotype level, like yeah, that. Absolutely. 
Also, um, uh, bear in mind that reproducibility beca becomes an issue because suddenly where your analyses before were on like a handful of genes, now you've got these huge data sets and you run simulations for months on end or something. For anyone to replicate that, it's going to take a lot of time, a lot of resource. Um, and so you have claims that aren't unverifiable, but won't be verified necessarily. Yeah. So not unverifiable, but we don't have time to go and check them. And the PR department of the university has already written the damn... Uh, footnote that got sent out to the science press. And since we haven't trained science at uh, um, writers, which is what I wanted to be um, uh, in forever, they don't know how to be critical about the stupid press release. And all of a sudden you got a bunch of bat. Like I actually do think the state of the communication of what's actually going on in genetics has gotten worse in the past 20 years since the, since the finishing of the initial sequence of the genome. Oh yeah, absolutely. Without uh, doubt. Like, and, and so you have more big claims made in the public to people who do not have the background to understand that, I mean, it, it's, people would be surprised that this could end up being a similar replication crisis to the crisis uh, in psychology, but um, people don't think about that in quote hard sciences at all, because they don't think about the way models are important to hard sciences. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think um, modeling and this sort of um, talking about things like the inability to reproduce work and um, how uh, we were talking about like how we can only reject models, but none of this stuff is appealing because it doesn't produce papers, it doesn't produce funding. I like talking about these things because this is where you're butting up directly against what science looks like um like under modern day capitalism um and i think that's like useful both in talking to non-scientists and making the link but also talking to scientists who aren't necessarily um particularly um not, not just political but like these conversations around the nature of modeling aren't aren't they're, they're not prevalent like i they don't necessarily come up um and i mean it's frankly it's absurd they don't because it's such a I mean, it's such a focal part of everyone's existence, but specifically as a scientist of what you do. I always think about, you know, the the highly problematic person, Lawrence Krauss, before we knew how awful he was <laughs> as a human being. Um, but that's not here nor there for this. I always thought about his rejection of philosophy of science. Like, they, he didn't even want to deal with the demarcation problem. Like, he would just laugh it off. And I'm like, how do you justify what you're doing based off results if you don't even understand what wouldn't be scientific according to this model? Like, because everybody with any sense, aka everybody with any training in a science, realizes that the stuff we teach you about but the Baconian scientific method in, in high school or middle school, depending on uh, or whatever it is in, in England, uh um but in your in your preteens and teens is only true for very there's less sciences that is true for than sciences it is true for yeah um and it's always been an issue i mean I, it's always been an issue in in uh, Dar uh darwinian biology because darwinian biology is the thing that kind of starts the crisis of the paradigm in the first place because um, I, I mean, people, uh, I think people lose this when they read, when, well, they don't read Darwin now, but when they hear about Darwin now, it's, these are initially inferences from historical data that are consistent and verifiable in their consistency, well, non-falsifiable in their consistency. Let me rephrase that. Um, but, uh, even on the on the standpoint of strict falsification um are almost impossible to truly falsify and definitely impossible to verify and don't follow anything like the scientific method as it was used in like chemistry or our uh, basic physics um before physics got all weird in the 20th century <laughs> um and i find that I find that question kind of interesting because I like you also find that when I deal with people who are trained in sciences, they do not question this. Like 
And then, and then I go, well, how do you know how to figure out what variables you're modeling? Um, and, uh, for, you know, for this, I mentioned my background in anthropology, but my, my foreground now is in, uh, in educational research, um, which I won't call a science, <laughs> um, but there are scientific elements to it, but we can't agree on like basic paradigms of verifiability and generalizability and some of that is because of legal constraints on the capitalism some of that's because of institutional constraints some of that's because implied science is really hard to do that way but some of it is philosophical like yeah. um and when i mention this to say my administrator who's just telling me some foot some like they read an abstract of a paper once and made a policy out of it. They look at me like I am insane. So, um, and so, okay. Why? I guess this is interesting. You, you, you were interested, you know, you mentioned reading Marx and you also seem like me to be somewhat frustrated with the people who want to, want to, vindicate every jot and tittle of dialectics of nature or um our historical and dialectical materialism by stalin or whatever um we both find that kind of funny the same way we find people who like argue that the big bang didn't happen off of 18th and 19th century understandings of math um and what trotsky said once um <laughs> Off of 18th and 19th century understandings of math. Uh, we find that funny. But in what way is it actually helpful to you in trying to build models? Because that's, you know, one of the things I think you and I initially talked about is you thought it was kind of an interesting way to start looking at how to figure out models and, and deal with um, model limitations, etc. Yeah, so I mentioned earlier that I kind of came into my my interest in um, evolutionary biology came very much through sort of adaptationism and like as I sort of read Marx, sort of started reading around dialectic systems theory, it was it became like the rejection of it became um very intuitive because it, i mean it's just like a, a rejection of like cartesian reductionism of the idea that you can just like isolate variables um in this very simplistic way and then um determine causality just doesn't really make any sense in a world that's obviously incredibly complicated um and i think this is why i i, I very much enjoy that kind of intersection between science and marxism because um for, like just on a personal level, I've uh, both sides have benefited the other in my understanding. Um, now, I uh, I think where um, so I um, initially started talking to Esri and we had um, and it's, I think it's something you share and you, you guys have talked about this on Mortal Science is um, like um, how much of dialectics is still like what can we actually salvage from dialectics um and i mean to that question i i i'm, I'm not sure there is much there is um a recent i mean it's not that recent i don't think um, richard levins um wrote an essay which was a response to john maynard smith where he was um talking about what is salvageable about dialectics that systems theory can't doesn't give you and i i mean it mostly centers around um like the idea of like the whole or like the totality being um the starting point and i don't i don't find it convincing that you can't take this from systems theory as well so i i think there's like I mean, you, you know my thesis that dialectics as understood hegelian dialectics as emerging out of historical dialectics and for those i'm going to just make this point for everybody who gets the words confused this is where varn is really comfortable pontificating historical dialectics just means argumentation done in a debate to figure out the meaning of terms so when you read plato's dialogues those are dialectical dialogues now 
when you get to German idealism, there is a shift from dialectics as a mode of argumentation where the terms are undefined to a shift where we understand concepts like emerging in history. Hegel and these concepts come out of historical events being treated like arguments, like the, like the history becomes the argument itself. So we see, you know, this uh, stoicism as an answer to this, you know, um, to this problem of Socratic, whatever, a uh, Seren uh, Sereniac ism is uh, also an answer to this. These are dialectical answers. And then this third thing pops up that's a negation. Um, and according to Hegel, this emerges in history as an almost negative emanation of an absolute idea, which is God. Okay, okay. What I find interesting about that, though, when you model, say, the stuff in the longer logic, uh, there are ways in which that is mathematically useful. All right. So Marx tries to do some of the same things. But what he does, and, and this is for people who don't kind of understand what he means when we say, because Marxists throw this around and never explain it. Like, he turns Hegel on his head. Well, what they mean by that is the ideas emerge from observation in history and they're practical. And there's only so many ideas that are going to catch on in any given mode of social reproduction. Doesn't mean that you can't think them. It just means that, like, they're not going to be popular because they're not useful. And that's how you have the emergence of abstractions from the real. So instead of an absolute idea negatively emanating these things, they emerge in the world. I actually think Marx's dialectics is a good starting point to getting to systems theory. But once you get various kinds of systems theory, you don't really need it anymore. It's like, it would be like us insisting on doing... And I think uh, Stephen Jay Gould even makes this point. It would be like us insisting on doing um, biology on purely Darwinian observations without any reference to, Men uh, to Mendelian uh, genetics, just because that's how the concept started and we wanted to use the pure form of the idea. Um, I do think there's a direct line. I mean, like, it, it's, it's hard... It, it's really through um, Vienna, but there is a direct line from dialectical thinking into systems theory thinking and also other failed modalities of understanding science, such as logical positivism, which people don't really understand. I, I, I kind of, this is a, a, a real rant on what we're talking about, Viv, so you can forgive me on this, but like, I'm now on this, uh, like we must vindicate the logical positivists because they're the they're the people who disprove themselves, not you. Shut up. Like, like Hempel disproved like they disproved verificationism themselves. It was not an outside, oh, they weren't all proven wrong. It was their own research project that negated their initial assumption. And then we just drop them after that, even though they're super important and interesting. Um and I find it fascinating. Because other attempts to do Marxism without reference to dialectics after them are dumb. Uh, like, like you know, I, Esri and I come about this from two different ways. I come about it from being really interested in, in dialectics, and Esri comes at it from being really interested in analytic uh, Marxism. And what I find fascinating about analytic Marxism is everything it takes out of the dialectical method, it doesn't replace with systems theory, it replaces with some weird bourgeois assumption of the 1970s and 80s, such as rational choice theory, or a marginal utility theory, or something like that, um, which I just think is, it, it actually makes it less useful than when you're reading something like Joseph Tainter, who applies systems to psychology, I mean, not through ecology, and back on history. And yes, you know, there's some assumptions in the models. And yes, I can argue ad infinitum about whether or not it's a metaphor. But, um, and man, me and the physicists do not agree. 
Um, but uh, it may it, it actually proved a point to me about when I went and realized that I was like, oh, we have a philosophical difference on when the line is, not just on what science can say, but when the line from an analogy and a metaphor and just a word comes in, and that line is different and unstated and unquestioned. Um, and that really matters when you're trying to, say, define terms. Now, one of the th good things about biology is, I will say, uh, genetics and genomics are still pretty well defined. It's not like, say, dialectics, where we're arguing about what, I don't know, history means. But, um, and, you know, it was that problem that led me to the Lakatoshian popper, like, synthesis that I have, where you need a good research question, and it needs to be the most probable not wrong answer because i do think probability fucks up absolute verif uh, absolute falsificationism but like um like okay what is the what can we say with some with some relative certainty we have no evidence that that probability is ever going to come up right yeah i think if you buy into like Lakatoshi's research programs then probability makes a lot of sense because his critique of um falsification is that you have programs that have been falsified but that continue and then are re-emergent and so to some extent it, even if it is to a, an entirely arbitrary level you have to make a judgment call on um whether that research program is worth pursuing even though it has been falsified to some extent because it like for example um as we were talking about way back lamarckianism has been falsified um I would not want to resurrect a Lamarckian project, but there are elements of Lamarckianism which we should probably study again because we have epigenetic evidence that that there might be a reason why that was a valid observation. And we're not trying to like save Lamarck because I mean you don't need to save a scientist. He was doing the best work that he was doing at the time he was doing it. Um, but we, it is an interesting way to see that that you know. There are other complications to the simple uh, gene adaptionist paradigm, and there has to be, right? Um, uh, there are other fun. I'm trying to think of other fun examples of this. Sapphire Wharfism is is one scientifically that's been completely rejected, but recently has been resurrected, but in a modified, highly reduced form. So no one really believes in hard linguistic determinism and completely separate worlds between people who speak languages anymore. But there is now some, some people are taking seriously that there are some perspectival influences of language that do have to be taken seriously in the way people conceptualize frameworks and stuff like even math. Um, but then immediately upon saying that, I guarantee you there will be a philosophical debate in my comments because I said that math was relative and not, absolutely fundamentally real and I, I i totally get the problems with that i'm not you know um but i, I think that's interesting so so you and i are both uh, on team complexity theory is a successor to dialectics my only defense of dialectics is that it was useful um to get out of purely analytic or predicate thinking um and kinds of thinking that cannot factor in time as a variable other than space. Right. And, I mean, there, there are still some works that use dialect. Like I, I, I read um, dance of the dialectic a while ago, and I found that incredibly useful just yeah. in terms, uh, but uh, I mean, that doesn't, as far as I remember, it doesn't even mention systems theory or complexity theory. Um, but it, it, I think again, it's like almost like if you, it's not so much about what you're using as your definition there, but ultimately like the approach and that's a useful approach. It's not, it's, it's a useful approach, both like in terms of hard sciences, but also in terms of like things like organizing. As I say, the dance of the dialectics is you, like Bertel Ehrman's for people who don't know. It's super useful as a, as a way to build models of oppositional forces, right? Like, and it, it is incredibly useful for that. Um, it doesn't mention system theory because Bertolt Orman being a Marxist humanist is a hyper fucking Hegelian. Um, 
But um, I also agree that that book is super useful. When people tell me, oh, it explains dialectics to me, I'm always like, well, it explains one reading of dialectics to mm. you. Because if I threw the longer logic at you, you're not going to get all of this either. Um, and I guess we could talk about like variations on systems theory or complexity theory that are more dialectical or less dialectical ones that take opposing uh, forces more seriously than others. I mean, um, and I think that I, I tend to look at opposing forces. I tend to look at contradictory for, although that word contradictory is confusing because it means different things uh, in different contexts, but that's why I often use opposing uh, like death is a contradiction of life. Is it really like that? That's not necessarily a useful way to think about it, buddy. That's, you know, that's like, uh, I don't know. Um, I always, my, my big insult for like vulgar dialectics is always like Taoist folk magic. Um, <laughs> Cause it's like the yin and the yang and the yin is in the yang and the yang is in the yin. And I'm like, yeah, but you haven't figured out if your concepts are valid or your categories make sense. So yeah, and that's that's <laughs> probably the version of dialectics that I hear most, like just on a sort of day to day basis in conversation with people. Oh yeah, I mean, because that's, I mean, that's what the bastardization of Hegel, which which they're also which is actually Kant's dialectics, it's not even Hegel's, but that that people get and then they read. Mao's uncontradiction, which is frankly just a work of propaganda, like it is not a methodological treatise, in it, like at all. Um, and that stuff is, I, I think that'll break your brain because it, it, it is you, you, you start seeing like that everything must have an opposing force, and then you just start figuring you, you, you kind of post talk why it's an opposing force. And you know what? That's not going to do that much. It's going to make you kind of weird in like social categories trying to to build off this. I don't think it's that useful. I think it lead to some 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 bad analysis, but I don't think it's going to be the end of the world. But you start trying to do biology based off that or physics based off that and you might actually do damage. Yeah, so I think this is what becomes so useful because it's actually like applying it um that's that's kind of the test really and too often there's not like it's it becomes such a vague thing that has no like concrete application um and this is where i'm somewhat sympathetic to analytics because what you do have is application um where esri and i started our sort of conversations was like you had dialectics in some form um emerging within capitalism through um systems theory uh, through cybernetics um obviously it had multiple like origins but at that point um what, what what does that tell us as sort of like an underpinning of like a marxist program um and that's something that sort of we've been kind of discussing like as a project um and uh, ultimately i think well, for, uh, for people who don't know, um, the original mission of mortal science, would we, which has it's moved away from over time, um, was Esri and I taking seriously what it would look like to say Marxism was a science. And immediately I went to Lakatos and I was like, we can't agree on any terms. <laughs> Since we can't agree on any terms... It cannot even be a pseudoscience. We we don't know what we're referring to when we speak to each other, right? And that was it. and so basically we moved the project to talk about talk about broader things because as an answer that becomes like very unsatisfactory. Marxism may have been a scientific program, and actually Lakatos explicitly says this. Marxism may have been a scientific program. Um, it is not anymore because it has total research decay for a variety of reasons. It's degenerated, yeah. Yeah, um, it's degenerated. And so 
we now talk past each other when we use terms. The terms are not mutually comprehensible between people ostensibly doing the same research. Um, and, and, you know, and then people will tell me, well, but Marxism is a, is the science of revolution. And it's uh, okay. I'm like, what is it? I don't know what the fuck that means. Actually, you've never been able to find it. So whoever wins notably the in this, no one ever defines what they mean by science. <laughs> never mind. No, they what don't. They mean by Marxism. Our revolution are, you know, um, so, so, um, I recently read a critique of Marxism that I thought was insightful, but wrong, but, you know, but insightful in in a lot of things. And one of the things that it kind of calls us out on, for example, is like Marxists say all history is class struggle, but it defines struggle in like 85 different ways, even in the primary text. And I'm like, shut up. Cause that's true. Um, and so then you have to kind of like, I take a, I take a systems theoretic view of this. Well, okay, well, what do we actually mean? Like, what are the different variables involved in struggle? Where do we find them? Um, what are the different variables? I mean, like, another famous one is, and this is when Esri makes a, a big deal about it, since Marx uses dialectical methodology, uh, you don't start with defining terms, you end with defining terms, and he didn't finish any damn thing. So, like, even basic terms like proletariat and working class, which they have there are, if you read manuscript editions of like the Communist Manifesto or whatever, you can find other versions that have definitions in them, but they're inconsistent with later definitions. And then miraculously, the most famous one is the damn Capital Volume 3 ends, right? When he's about to find the working class, like, because he doesn't really, arguably, he was not satisfied with any, any definition that he had at that point. And then which is i think fine as a methodology because what is contested is the definition right there's nothing wrong with that but then this allows people to abuse that vagary for 250 years um it would be like if uh darwin had not defined natural and sexual selection and we got to the end of origin of the species and it was about to say sexual selection is and it was blank <laughs> like so yeah i will say i think marxism has a i do not think marxism is a pseudoscience i do think it is scientific in its initial inclinations given what it is aiming to do um but i do not think it could be called a science because i do not think it the, the other problem is i don't think it has one research program i think it has like 80 um, yeah, although that's not necessarily a problem in itself if terms are being used, like if everyone's working off the same terms, but they're not, mm, as you said. But we're not anymore. Like, yeah. I, I, like, mean, I, 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 I agree. I, I think, um, I, like it, the the like defining it as a degenerated research program makes a lot of sense. Now, um. I don't know if you've, there's an essay by Michael Burewoy where he talks about, like he argues that it's not necessarily a degenerated because you you have this, um, so in the Lakatosian paradigm, you have um, like a positive heuristic, which is kind of the like satellite um, um, positions within the research program rather than the internal core, which is the hard core of it, which is never refuted. And he argues that you had that, um, like these positive heuristics, which were um, you gained new positive heuristics through, for example, Lenin's use of the state, through Luxembourg's mass strike. But even if you are going down that road, which I don't find convincing, what's happened in the last century? What 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 positive heuristic has arisen in the last century? No, very little. I mean, I I recently interviewed. Uh... Alex Prahauser, who is um, who's a mathematician, um, finishing, um, I, he has a graduate degree and he specializes in category theory. And he did convince me that like category theory and its role in systems theory and computational theory does directly come out of Hegelian di dialectics. And here's where, and this is how it's useful 
and this is how it plays in with set theory and where it pushes against that theory and, and um and i find that interesting but then I, I i go to well it's interesting that we can save some of the impulses of marxism only in the most abstract of of sciences aka math which also i'm not sure actually counts as a science because it does not even attempt to have a falsification criteria <laughs> so also what you're doing is you're taking an aspect of a research program and putting it to work in another one it's it's utility in the original one still isn't really there yeah yeah so con yeah category theory uh which comes out of dialectics, it would be like, I guess it's to use a metaphor. Um, it would be like building a knife out of the bone of a whale. Like um, it, the whale's dead. There's no more whale. Um, but we got, we got these useful apparatuses from it that if we chip away at it, we can use it. And maybe we argue, some of us are weird. We really want to hold on to the wellness of that knife um and good on you i guess it's of some historical importance but most people it's not going to matter now i do take i do take stephen jay gould going all the way back to the introductory essay and the structure of uh, of what evolutionary theory does argue that if marxism was successful it also would have a similar problem because we would have developed so many new technologies out of uh, our new ways of understanding, new models, et cetera, out of it, that we wouldn't refer back to. We like we wouldn't all be having capital reading groups anymore because it like it would be it would just be obvious, right? And what I find interesting, and I, I like the capital the stuff because that's the stuff where there is some empirical backing, but the methodology in which it is used may be questionable. Like my favorite never-ending debate is off of you know, declining rates of profit, which I model on using GDPs, which I admit is not the way Marx does it. And I explain it differently than Marx did in Capital Volume 2. Um, I actually think it's multi-causal, and that's why it's a tendency and not an absolute law. Blah, 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 blah. Right? Like, um, but then there are people who will just argue that it's not a thing because there's a bad argument in capital volume two and i'm like well that only makes sense if you think that science early scientific works have to be completely fucking coherent and correct because if if you believe that i got some things to tell you about darwin <laughs> like so you know um i mean i think the most famous one is his revision to survival of the fittest which has been a nightmare uh, which is not even in the original text, and he like buckled under pressure with talking to Herbert Spencer. Um, uh, and because fittest implies a teleology that he didn't initially would wish to apply, right? Okay, yeah. all interesting to get back to this. Why is it important for socials to have a conception of this? I mean, uh, do you listen to Arnold? Uh, I do, yes, yeah, uh, he's my favorite. Even though I'm often like, I'm often like, hey, bro, there are like new studies. You're basing some studies from like the 70s. Like, um, he, he synthesizes the material so well. Um, he's an excellent communicator. Yep. It's also, this is why it's important just for our scientist friends. Make sure someone can communicate what you do to the fucking public. Yep. It may not be you, but you need to make sure someone can do it because. In, in, in comprehensible terms, I mean, this is the only argument that Richard Dawkins ever made that I took seriously, because, like, for most people, I don't know, I mean, the argument they're always arguing about is intelligent design, but I'm like, no, you need people to understand, I don't know, why their antibiotics work, and yeah. what's the danger in overprescribing them, and why that could be real fucking bad, like, <laughs> you know, it's a pretty big deal. Um, so where where we've been on a kind of tangent, but to tie it back into what you actually study, where's population uh genetics going right now? Like what are the what are the debates? Where's it headed? We talk about this abundance of information. Um 
and this inability to do proper studies because they'd have to be both they kind of have to be longitudinal meta analysis to really start getting what we would want for soundness of conclusions. And that would take, I don't know, 150 years or something. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm you'd, you'd want exaggerating, but not much. Yeah. yeah. I guess if you work with fruit flies, you can do it quicker. But well, yeah. <laughs> um, Sorry, so what was the question? Where I was just asking you, where's the, where's the field going? And why might radicals care about it? Those, I guess there's two questions. So let's answer the first one first. Where's it going? So it's honestly, it's hard to say where it's going um, because you still have these live debates that we've discussed between those of us who want to like uh, model things uh, or create, like generate these, um, try to develop like very, like rigorous null models and those who want to like pursue the sort of program that already exists um, and actually expecting some sort of paradigm shift there is maybe unrealistic considering what we've already talked about in terms of like how science is funded, how people need to get papers out and things like that and time, like time limits in terms of like PhD student only has so many years, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, like, as um, sequencing technologies improve, as um, computational yeah. um, capacities um, increase, what you're likely to have is more of the same, like, just to a greater extent, at least, like, for a while. It, on the other side of it, you'll have, um, like, as you start trying to incorporate... So one of the things that our lab does is... Um, joint inference so where you're trying to you 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 can have like a two-step approach where so for example you will try to infer like the demographic history of a population and then you'll try and to infer um background selection so that's basically talking about um purifying selection so when deleterious uh, mutations are removed from the population however both influence each other so if you infer one before the other then you are biasing your estimate for the second so joint inference has um be like something that's been developed over the last few years and is now being used in the field by some people. However, that's just two forces. Then there's other things to factor in which are also influenced. And this is where it becomes complicated because you have all these forces that act on each other and influence each other. So to try and infer one means um, you have to infer all the others at the same time. So there is like attempts to move into that direction. And that um, perspective I sent you, that kind of talks about some of this stuff. Um, but yeah, ultimately, like, again, that becomes more and more complicated. Like, this isn't even a computational problem. It's just whether it's actually feasible, because it, what ultimately the underlying method is something like approximate Bayesian computation, where you are have a set of priors and you're trying to hone those priors um, just by basically brute force, try, basically trying every single um, different permutation or not every single one. But obviously, after you can, like, narrow that down based on your posterior, so just to briefly explain what you have is your prior distribution for a parameter um you simulate it you can compare it to your data based on summary statistics and then you can produce a posterior distribution and that basically narrows down your prior and then you just keep going until you've actually um got some sort of reasonable inference um obviously that's extremely time consuming um both resource wise and time wise um and so the more parameters you have that you're trying to do jointly, the the like this sort of it just think the parameter uh, space increases um, massively. Um, so it's it's hard to see like um, where that's going to end up. Now, in terms of why radicals should care about this, I think there's like I mean, there's what I've already mentioned in terms of like. Um, what science looks like under capitalism and its limitations. But I think there's also like a lot of like, like just in terms of actually understanding what modeling is, understanding how like abstraction works in terms of building abstract models, um, understanding like, now these don't just have applications like in terms of like um, in academia or in science. I, I just think back to like simple things like um, actual like strategies for um socialist strategies and things you have no way what you are ultimately doing is 
people talk about a theory of change, but what you've got is a model of change. Now, no one, no one um, produces or discusses how what what we need to reject that model. It's falsification right there, and because we don't do that, so you have the same thing repeated over and over again. Oh yes, we do, and yeah, 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 exactly. Like we we since we have no falsification, fuck, we don't even know how to discuss conditional priors, like, yeah. like. I'm like, I'm always just telling people when they want to talk about, for example, we have a theory of change and that theory of change is the Bolshevik revolution. And I'm like, what conditional priors do we share with Russia in 1910? Yeah, exactly. And, and functionally, like there's like, we're people, we live in a society, there's capitalism going on, although not ne- like we're way at a different stage of it than they were. I, I don't really see that many other priors, though. Like, um, you know, when we talk about, for example, conditions of dual power, uh, I, I've actually told people this is an interesting thing to look at. So um, when is it successful and when is it not? And I don't mean successful in like your local group got 150 cadres. I mean, when does it actually produce things? And then I'm like, well, our models for that, we have the Bolsheviks. Then we have various religious groups, actually. I don't have another model for that from a left-wing group that was successful. I have Hezbollah. I have um, the Puritans, actually. I have um, Hamas, to some degree. And then then I'm like, well, what do these things share? And I'm like, well, class collaboration, uh, a state in maximum entropy, or no state at all because you're being shipped out to some new place. Um, high ideological conformity for other, re- like, and then I'm like, so what are these? Do you, you know, what are these? Are you going to be able to reproduce? Um, uh, I get a lot from uh, Daniel of what is politics when we talk about you got to tell in societies and like push back on David Graeber, where we're like, well, you know, I believe you know, we could organize things another way and we have evidential proof that we could you provide some of it but i want you to think about not just that we commit to that but what do you have to build as priors to make that stable because belief we i we got more negative examples in history than positive for that for almost anything right like now we can get all funky about what belief means right but yeah i totally agree with you i also think like this is why I always talk about terminal no- nominalism and people get mad at me because nominalism is not, you know, but I'm like, dude, terms aren't real. Like there's like the words we use just speaking uh, have a history, but they don't have like a platonic meaning. Um, and so when we talk about these things, we have to be able to parse that we're talking about the same things. And that's really important, not just for like research, but like for doing shit. Because it's one thing to use the vagary of a term like justice rhetorically. It's another thing to try to build an action plan off of a vagary of a term like justice that we don't all actually have a definition of. Yeah. Like, um, so yeah, it's very, very important. Um, I think another thing is I do think we have to take the most recent science and even if it's capitalist or whatever, uh, in, uh, and we know the limitations, but we have to take the most recent science and like um, human biology, uh, sociology, etc., at least seriously, even if we reject elements of it. Like, we, we can't just be like, eh, it doesn't fit with the political commitments that I've made, and my political commitments come from a 19th century knowledge base. Like, yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, I guess the other part of that is actually like having the skill set to pass a lot of scientific research because um yeah it would be a lot good if, if marxists at least could do math yeah like and i don't <laughs> mean like ca- i don't mean like calculus math because i can barely do that i mean like just like real numbers theory statistics al- linear algebra i one of the one of my things that I've always pointed on the economists, the econophysics people, but I was like, how many people are impressed by Paul Cockshop because they like what he has to say are because somebody actually did linear algebra in a goddamn Marxist text instead of just relying on loosey-goosey psychoanalytic categories or something. 
Yeah. Like, because you know, there are all kinds of problems in, in Cockshot beyond his, you know, beyond all the cultural assumptions he brings into it. But it was nice to see some modeling for once. Um, yeah. And in terms of like, if you, there's always um, various projects cropping up where um, there's both political education and research um, in various humanities, maybe in political science. Some of this can be done with the more theoretical computational fields in the hard sciences. I mean, there's limitations in terms of needing access to servers and things, but it's not like you need massive wet lab infrastructure and stuff like that. And so, I mean, even just sort of thinking through these things is quite useful um, because like a lot of this stuff, you develop skills by doing stuff hands on, but there's no, there's, I think there's, there's not a lot of interest in that. It's more geared towards um, things like um, political science and stuff like that. Well, I think, you know, whew, political science, you want to get me on a, <laughs> um, I will say this. I think everyone should reject political science after they've studied it enough to understand why they should reject it. They should not reject it before that. Also, I also realize that everybody can't study everything. Uh, and I know because I try to and I fail. Um, so, so, so when I, you know, people are always like, Varney, you're telling us to read everything. How do you do anything? I'm like, I'm not telling everyone to read everything. I'm telling some of you who'd be interested in this to read something. <laughs> like, like, you know, it's, I don't, like, for example, uh, I did not continue my studies in, in genetics other than, like, as a casual reader, I try to keep up with it because I do think it's important, but I, my ass is not going to be doing either dry or wet lab research. Um, but I will definitely, I, the reasons why I do think it's important though, for us to talk about this in terms of, of science or in terms of Marxism or whatever is conversations like this model, how you learn how to ask the right questions, because you can't ask people the right questions without any prior knowledge. This is a, a whole thing I talk about all the time and like bad education research. Like there was all this research in the nineties on, um, on students using computers and on digital nativity and how you didn't need to teach all this prior stuff, except that that the people, the, the students they were studying have been taught all that prior stuff. Like, um, and they knew how to ask questions in a way in which a Boolean search could bring it back. You, you, you have no idea how many times that I have given a uh, ask students to formulate a research question. They come up with a perfectly fine research question and they put it into EBSCO host or Google and they get out nonsense because they have no idea what to even ask for to answer the question. Um, and similarly with something like this, if you ask the wrong question right now, like if you're a Marxist and you ask the wrong question about biology and, and uh, dialectical biology, you're not going to get uh, Richard Lewontin. You're going to get weird neo yeah. uh that's been popular a bunch by a bunch of weirdos on Twitter that because of its a analytical shock comes up first on a fucking search when you put those words together. Um, but also, as you said, like the, the, the space has kind of been vacated um, because there is this very poor communication around the subject. Oh, yeah. I, yeah like... Now that, particularly now that uh, Richard Dawkins is just an Anglican prig who doesn't believe in God uh, and is no longer really even talking about science, he just seems to be talking about things to piss young people off. Um, I mean, I was thinking about this the other day. I was like, we don't have a Stephen Jay Gould or a Richard Dawkins right now at all. Um, and for me to talk about how we need a Richard Dawkins is a sad, sad state of affairs. We don't even have like, uh, we don't even have someone like Michael Ruse, who I think is like interesting at, uh, if you read some of Michael Ruse's work, um, it's really interesting at pop. He actually was good at like calling out the questions in biology in a way that a layman could understand. Um, but that's never been popular. We don't, the, the skeptics movement is now ran by weirdos who just call people groomers on Twitter. I mean, I'm sure there's others, but for the most part, the biggest names like James Lindsay and Dave Rubin, that's what they're devoting their time to, um, is total culture war. I mean, like a, a rational nonsense. 
Um, so I, I think, and I also feel like, you know, while there are a lot of us in the Marxist world interested in this, I feel like we've kind of vacated th- this field too. We don't talk about it very much. Like, yeah. um, it's, our, it's broad brush concepts from decades ago rather than anything up to date. Well, the amount of times I've had to have debates over whether or not the Big Bang happened is... <laughs> That's mad to me. It, um, is... I'm like, red shifting is a thing, <laughs> motherfucker! Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I can explain to you how we know we are moving in space and expanding. <laughs> like, um, I guess that doesn't necessarily prove that there was nothing before this universe, but I, we... We're honestly, when it comes to that, we are almost at a theological problem because I don't know how to express what it is to have infinite mass at a subatomic scale in a, another universe in a way that it means anything in human language. And I don't even know how we'd prove that. Like, it's like, like the Big Bang is kind of like, what's before the Big Bang is more like a limit to our knowledge. Mm. Like, like, it's not that there might not have been something before it. We can't. I don't even know how to articulate what that means in a way that isn't loosey goosey spiritual crap. Um, uh, so it's it it's uh, you know we all have our favorites. I used to be a diehard great contraction theory person until I realized there was no blue shift. Um, and there are things which I that I am skeptical on that I've been kind of schooled on. For example. I am sometimes a doubter of dark matter. <laughs> like okay. every, every now and then I'm like, are you sure that's just not a math mistake? <laughs> like, um, but then someone will explain to me how it actually has practical implications other than the math working. Cause I was like, ether was a math working problem. <laughs> um, uh, the, and so, just so you know, I am also given to crankery audience, um, but I'm, I'm willing to be wrong. And so when people explain to me, oh, no, we have other evidence than just the math. And I'm like, okay, can you explain well, it to me? That's and the key thing, isn't it? Being willing to be wrong. And again, it's like model rejection coming back to what we were talking about earlier, which is the problem with a lot of people on the left. Yeah, we... The, we Right. Well, one thing I, I used to tell Esri <laughs> uh, that used to send her in conniptions, and I was like, well, if, we, if you really want me to start talking about Marxism as a science, and we have to entertain the null hypothesis that the bourgeois, and I guess the null hypothesis is that the bourgeois won, it really is the end of history, and shut the fuck up. <laughs> like... Uh, <laughs> And then that's when Esri was like, but there are norm there are normative claims in this. And I'm like, well, yeah, there are. And that's also that's a weird problem in most forms of economics. It's not just a problem in Marxism, where the where the the line between normative and descriptive, MMT does this, neoclassical does this, gets real, real thin. Um I mean Marxism does it deliberately, like it's methodologically yeah. deliberate. And I kind of think it's like the biggest mistake we made. But because the the idea that the future we want is inevitable because we logically deduced it out is a real fucking funny assumption. Um, but I guess can you? You can't can disprove you... that. Yeah, <laughs> that is not a disprovable hypothesis. <laughs> like, but but that like that's my thing. It's like that's not a scientific statement. That's yeah. a, that's that's a faith statement. And by that, I literally mean like. We are committing ourselves to a teleological eschatology. Like, like that it must end this way. If it doesn't end this way. And and to be also to be fair to Marxists, Marxists have not been consistent if if the only way out of capitalism is communism. Like the, you know, the moment you ask the moment you ask the question that Rosa Luxemburg asked. You know, the socialism or barbarism actually fundamentally changed the claim. Like, uh, and to be fair to Marx, when I read Marx, Marx makes both claims depending on when you're reading it. Like, and sometimes it's inevitable. Sometimes it's, 
it's one of many possibilities. That's why he's concerned about like chattel slavery in the South, because he thinks that maybe there's some new horrible form of mode of production that combines capitalism and chattel slavery. That's got the worst of both worlds. Um, in, in light of climate change, socialism or barbarism seems more tractable, but again, yeah. it's, it's loosely defined. Well, I don't know what barbarism is really. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Like, what if it's socialism and barbarism? Like, <laughs> what what if we what if we off the the two? <laughs> like, we have socialist barbarism, or we just get primitive communism again because we just fell that far backwards. <laughs> like, it's all these are possibilities that I can that I can model out. Yeah, and also it's going to be like heterogeneous across the globe whatever happens so it's yeah it, these it, sweeping it, statements are always that, that, freak me that's out. the funny thing it's well that's a, that, that is that does raise a whole question to this is why i mentioned probability this is like the model i guess maybe our marxist friends going to use this as a sense of false hope uh that, that their model could be correct um and doesn't need to be modified I, I, my dirty secret is, is I'm a Marxist, but because I'm a Marxist, I, I kind of think we have to change the theory in some place and it's figuring out where we need to change it. Um, because pretty clearly the predictions, and there are a couple of different ones, and yes, they do contradict each other, but they didn't happen. Yeah. Like, like, Marxism catches on in the place it's not supposed to catch on. It does the kind of development you really don't want it to do. Uh, that actually goes the way people modeled, but they don't have an alternative to it. Um, I mean, you know, my, my favorite story about Plakhanov and Incan development. Well, Plakhanov is right about the, the the stuff about Incan development, but his answer was just, "We're going to be socialist and really try to promote communism." But by promoting communism. We're also going to promote capitalism so it can exist for us to destroy it. Because we don't want to have to do capitalist development ourselves uh, for the reasons of econ development, blah, blah, blah. And and that's, it's like, okay, so you gave yourself a false binary, so we have to spread the thing we hate to get what we want, like. Yeah. Like, yeah. and you realize that like, oh, accelerationism is not a new idea. Like, we, yeah. we've been it's been a bad inference for a thousand years. Like, <laughs> um, and I, when I say a thousand years, I mean like other kinds of thinkers have posited it for other things. Like we have to make things worse for them to get better is, and we have to actively do that is, uh, Marxism kind of... seems to me littered with like ignoring history. When, if you are a Marxist, the thing, that you have to understand more than anything else is history, is your current conditions and what they're contingent on. Well, um, why do you think that is? I mean, why do the historical materialists ignore both historical data and materialist data? <laughs> part of this is this is a slightly like facetious answer, but I think there is a slight tendency that no one wants to be like. A, a cog in a longer term history you want it in your lifetime um but more than that i i history is hard to study oh yeah and particularly when you're positing studying it scientifically which most historians have just utterly given up on yeah like like they're just like we can't do that like we got it's too complex and there's too many models upon models and we can't figure out how to transfer one model to another model we don't really know when there's a new idea or it's just a new way of expressing it and i'm like yeah it's it's real hard <laughs> like I, I i i remember listening to uh the mortal science episode where you talked about clear dynamics and for it's many many flaws as like it's it's trying to at least explore like whether you can do any of this yeah, uh, and, I, I, I mean it fails I, ultimately i like clear dynamics but because but it also points out the the importance of picking your models really really yeah. like clear dynamics limits itself to national data and thus actually brackets out international explanations for things in favor of generational ones it assumes 
that lower classes uh, are coherent, but they're also kind of stagnant reaction forces and that everything is actually between different factions of elites. Um, although, unlike most things, including current PMC theory, at least defines what it means by elites in a way that is both relative and coherent and not like 80% of the population or some stupid shit. Um, or forty percent, which is or sixty percent, depending on how you're counting and who counts as PMC on any given day, since none of the definitions match. Um, uh, I find that useful. Um, I do think it's wrong. I think it's actually I think clear dynamics under Turch ends up being kind of perniciously white ring, even if he doesn't mean it to be, and I suspect he does mean it to be. Um, but I can't prove that. Uh, but I do find the modeling like, OK, let's find mathematical trends in history. When I talk to historians about this, uh, what they often tell me is. That's a sociologist job. <laughs> and I'm like, da -da -da. Da so, so you view your job as just narrativizing data. And sometimes that is useful. I mean, like, like, for example, Carlo Ginsberg's work on micro history is actually useful for, for like pushing the idea that only certain thoughts are conceivable at certain times, for example, like the cheese and the worms really does blow your mind at what people may or may not think at any given time. Uh, and Arnold Schroeder talks about this and like, you know, you can be in an area that there's relative agreement because of, of what you do practically, but the narrative mode for why you do that practically, or the ideological mode for why you do that practically may be more diverse than the number of people there. Like, um, and I think that's an interesting observation. Uh, it's interesting we talk about this in terms of biology, because I do think one of the things Marxists have historically tried to do, and this is like where we have like our, for example, a historical ambivalence about things like eugenics, um, uh, it has to do with the fact that we do, we did originally take biology very seriously. Yeah. Um, um, and in fact, you know, Ingalls went so far as to try to work out a theory where it's like, well, these things that we're modeling in history model down into biology and physics and model up into grand historical systems. Uh, there's a bias and there's a symmetry bias in that, but whatever. Um, man, people get mad when I call symmetry and elegance biases. The math people really get mad when I do that because I'm like, but it's just a, you can't prove it. Like you can't prove that the world is actually elegant. Like yeah. it's useful for explanations, but it's not provable. <laughs> like, what's what? What is the actual variable in which we're going to figure out what what is simple or not in any given thing? Because depending on what we're looking at for simplicity or complexity, we're going to get different answers than what the parsimonious answer is. So yeah. elegance is not universally modable outside of math. Yeah, I mean it's a relative term, isn't it? Yeah, well, this is this is also the great bi battle between Ezri and I on whether or not math is real. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think I can guess what her <laughs> position is on this. This is why I call her a platonic witch all the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she is, uh, she, I'm actually not a math anti-realist. I'm a math abductionist. I think it's like I think it's an analogy to something to things that are real. But for example, I don't know that I think imaginary numbers actually exist or that there is a that there are uh another one is you know multiple encapsulated infinities i'm just like i don't know how useful that is and i don't think physically that's good like we <laughs> unless you just really want to play with fun things like xeno's paradox i don't see where this is you know anything other than conceptually useful i've been told i'm wrong about that and people can do so in the comments um uh but similarly uh on when we talk about genomes phenomes and morphologies i think this is one of these things where it's a little bit interesting but the popular understanding so skewed because i was like genome is not phenotype and neither phenotype nor genotype is morphology like because if we believe in in phenotype theory then uh then for example, um, 
black Africans are the most uh, phenotypically diverse group of people because of a plethora of reasons. Um, uh, but you would also then have to believe, and someone called me a racist for saying this once. It's kind of hilarious um, that that all peoples who are not black Africans uh, should be morphologically more similar because they are phenotypically more similar. And I'm sorry, that's just not in no world. Does that make any sense when you look at like genetic drift and and I'm not just talking about skin tone. I'm just like, there's the 85,000 variables in which you can map out the entire rest of the population is, is morphologically just as diverse. And, and we see similar things evolve in different areas with different groups. Um, like, for example, like uh, Austro-Asians uh, evolving things that look very similar to to trace you see in Africa are my favorite one that no one's been able to explain to me why the skin tone changed faster than it should under genetic time uh, um, biologically meaning like uh, when you move regions you actually get paler or not faster than uh, natural selection would indicate that you would um, is it punctuated equilibrium is is it Maybe there's some weird other thing. There's there's some epigenetic trait we don't understand. Is it, you know, and there's a thousand possible answers. And I'm just, I don't know the actual research on this. Well, I just know that that initial thing is true. What's the, why is there an a priori expectation as to how fast it should evolve? That's a good question too. Um, I think it, I, th I think the a priori expectation is based off adaptionist assumptions. Yeah, and, it sounds that way. Um, and when I first heard this question, I was like, I remember just it blowing my mind and me know, realizing that there was something about the adaptionist model that didn't work because I'm like, well, no one's arguing that like there's Lamarckian inputs on skin color. So what is the reason? Right. Um, and where did you get your time frame from? Mm. And why is that assumed? Um, I mean, I get part of why people care about it because this is one of these things where you can just slap racist around and be like, okay, well, you like your skin tone changes faster than other parts of your biology, so you literally pick the dumbest trait to base all your assumptions on. But, um, <laughs> you know, and as much as it is nice to like take a race realist and smack them around a little bit with some science, um, uh, it's actually not all that explanatory. Like I don't have a good explanation. I've never read one either. Like, and, and you're right. Maybe, maybe the question is bad. Like maybe uh, we are yeah. modeling the question wrong. Yeah. Like, um, how there's no, like how fast a trait evolves is dependent on so many factors, like the right. level of genetic variation in the population selection pressures. Yeah. Selection pressures is also like, code word for 50,000 different things. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> it's not just a case of you've moved and therefore there's a change in environment. This <laughs> It's like selection pressure can be anything from does sun radiation fuck with your tamarase and you get cancer to uh, um, I don't know, sexual selection being, being triggered in some way to X number of people die from I don't know really bad sunburn i see none of these actually make sense to me when i actually think about it i'm like why would any of this be um i i actually wonder it a lot because i'm like we have no evidence for either sexual nor natural selection for why it happens i guess you do, i mean i i guess having like we do know that having more melanin has has strategic advantage but what would be the advantage to losing it um maybe okay. more vitamin d absorption so again the problem is you fall into adaptation having... thinking where you start going oh well maybe it's costly to produce exactly <laughs> right 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 you're right right and and the the adaptation the adaptation thing is so appealing because it yeah. seems to give you an immediate explanation yeah it's it's extremely intuitive and like as a but it's young... all post hoc it's all yeah, post hoc yeah, exactly <laughs> 
in some ways I'm doing with a physical trait what evolution what we were just complaining an hour ago about evolutionary biologists doing with a social or mental trait. Like we're we're seeing something exist, we're realizing there's a problem in the explanation, and we're going, well, we know that there is a thing called genetics. We know that we have all these assumptions off of all these other models. We should assume, and we are going to say assume here, that this works the same way because, I don't know, reasons. And because of said reasons that we may not even be able to articulate, we can then post hoc pocter a couple of reasons why this may be. But there's literally no, like, I do think about that. There's no way of verifying some of these things. Like, how the, or excuse me. We shouldn't talk about verification. I don't know how you'd falsify in the scale of any set of human knowledge, like whether or not uh, having lighter skin in colder climates gives you vitamin D benefits. Like how would how would we falsify that or prove it? You can't yeah, prove because it, but... you're talking about something that's like abstract. You're talking about a fitness advantage. You you can. Like, try and identify, like, doing what we've talked about before, you develop your novel model, et cetera, et cetera, where you can like, try and identify genes, uh, like, identify, like, variants that are distinct between your populations. Um, but in terms of actually, like, drawing the whole, like, narrative out from genotype to phenotype, but including, like, conclusively saying that it's a fitness advantage. Yeah, I have no idea how you do that. Like, because I'm also thinking about, well, it's hard to impossible. It's nearly impossible to falsify because you could always go, well, the conditions now are different than the conditions a thousand years ago. Right? Yeah. Like, well, I guess can... we could model, I guess you can model it abstractly, but I don't know how you'd prove it. Well, you can look at, like, so there are, like, analytical expectations in terms of you have, um, a beneficial mutation occurs and how fast it will spread through a population but again to actually um that rate will be dependent on all the other factors that we've previously discussed because you want to be you want to have like a null model that's acting upon and even then all you've got what you're saying is you've got your beneficial you also have to confirm that that beneficial mutation is implicated in literally that mutation is the one that's implicated in the change in skin color in this case yeah, that seems infinite. The, the number of variables in that, even in the individual, much less in the population, seems really damn daunting. Like, yeah. Because um, like, there's not one gene marker that gives you skin color, for example. There's probably well, like several. Exactly the thing. So, I mean, we actually have so few studies that go all the way from like tracing a genotype to a phenotype where you can tell that whole story um, all the way across. And that's like... I think when, when you tell this to a layperson, it seems nuts because that not that kind of like the entire point of um, a lot of what we're doing? Yeah, it, they're going to feel like a lot of press releases that they read in a in Scientific American uh, was a ripoff. Um, was like, well, and you know what? Actually, I think that's I think that's actually important to point out um, because. I see a lot of the weird anti-science sentiment that really is dangerous coming from kind of taking bad face science pitches at at face value. I mean, the obvious ones are like the real shaky sciences, like fucking nutrition are, uh, you know, are my my favorite one is people you know looking at bad climate predictions from 50 years ago and just throwing away climate modeling entirely because there was one bad prediction um and stuff like that but i do think some of that would happen anyway because you know there's going to be some amount of motivated thinking in population see we've talked about this with marxists and their more sophisticated versions and trying to bring back lysenkoism for example um but uh and and I also want to just remind people, people who do this are not stupid. It takes a lot of effort to maintain belief systems and a lot of intelligence, actually, to maintain belief systems that are just weird. Um, but I do think there's a lot of, like, folk misunderstanding of science because it's sold to people 
with more causal uh, certainty than it should be. Um, and we're not just talking about like in the in the kind of like, well, there's more experiments to done. There's sometimes like we don't even know where the experiment would begin and end. Like um, and someone just told you X was true and they're not understanding like scaling up either. So like biology is more complicated than chemistry. Chemistry is more complicated than physics because you're dealing with more variables at layers of existence, right? You start talking about sociology, you have near infinite complication. I do remember a good report that talked about how sociology and psychology actually did a lot of the same things as um, as the quote hard sciences unquote. It's just that the you can't even fathom the number of causal variables you need to control for. Like, yeah. I mean, at its at its simplest, that's that is the problem, isn't it? Like, you are just adding layers, and this is like your number of variables massively increases. Your models, how do you develop like a tractable model where you can actually um, test it? <sighs> so I'm not going to get to be Harry Sheldon, is what you're telling me. <laughs> like, my dream of using dialectical materialism to build foundations empire. <laughs> uh is uh with a computer uh, by the way i love that's what, what people think cybernetics is too it's just like they think it's a computer telling you to do things <laughs> like oh god no <laughs> it's information relays man like um but yeah i uh i think this has been good because we can actually model we have inadvertently in the last half an hour of this conversation modeled the problems of what we're talking about. Now, when you apply that to Marxism and we talk about Marxism and history, you're dealing with a scale of all of human history. Yeah. Yeah. Like and you have to like, I think um, uh, this, this, this is even a problem where, there's a lack of understanding of different like types of modeling, like in terms of abstraction or idealization. Um, and so like, I, I assume most people know what an abstract model is, but it's just basically cutting out of your model what you can, to some extent, hold constant. It's just assumed that it's not affecting what's inside your model. Now, that is a skill in itself, how you actually develop, how you actually develop that model. And the more complex your system you're dealing with, the harder it gets to actually do that mm -hmm. um and yeah as you said with marxism you, it's like I, I i don't know which edition it is of capital uh volume one where marx uh in one of the prefaces or the introduction i can't remember but he talks about his method of abstraction and i i love the fact that he talks about that because right there he's saying like what his like approach actually is and that's so vital and it's something that's largely ignored yeah, I, I actually like, and oh my God, is ignored by people like Lukash. Um, um, the whole like Marxism is a method and method has no content, but the method is like whatever the workers do, like, except when the workers don't do that and it needs to be with the party of the workers because I got to revise this so I don't get executed um, is not a good way to justify Marxism. But I do think, for example, when I realized that what Marx is coming up with in terms of like abstraction really mirrors onto emergent concept theory. Like, um, and then I'm like, Oh, well, he's just, he's, he's intuiting something ahead of the game, but we actually do have something that can do this now. Right. Um, and when you, and I get why I get why I mentioned it in a while back. I get why there's so many Marxists who are distrustful of this, because attempts to do this ad hoc, like in the analytic Marxist, end up sneaking things that, like sneaking concepts that seem legitimate, but were actually problematic themselves, like marginal utility theory as opposed to labor theory. Like nobody who studies practical, like actual economics in the field now, whether you're right or left, actually believes marginal utility theory is true. That is literally something that only econometrics people and certain kinds of neoclassical economists assume like um so i find that interesting 
But then I also do get the frustration of like when we talk about value, for example, I'm like, well, value is I use the kind of physics definition where value is an is is like the is the aggregate surplus of all prices all together. And like any individual price can be whatever, but it's and and we don't ever reach it exactly. It's actually like a statistical projection. And then, I, but then I say, then I have to say, like that, that's not really what Marx said. It was um, that's just a way that we can use it, and it does help model what Marx is trying to model, right? And what I find interesting about Marx is there's lots of stuff in Marx and in Engels. Like Engels intuits some things about, for example, uh, family relations and, and early human dynamics that actually ended up being correct, and he based it off of real shitty anthropology. He just happened to accidentally be right or deduce deduce good things from bad sources or whatever um at least for our i should preface that for our current understanding because who knows we might discover something that fucks us all up um but you know it's interesting that i think there's plenty in marxism uh, or in marx and Engels that you can salvage um but Marxism as a concrete philosophy of everything, or even as a concrete philosophy of political economy that has pre it has politically predictive norms about who's going to win in the long durée of history, that really isn't a scientific question. I, I don't know how to make it a scientific question. And if you do make it a scientific question, you have to go that, well, the theory is wrong, right? Yeah. Or... or or you have to say we have to deal in time scales that are so long that we won't ever like it's going to take us a thousand years to know whether the theory is wrong or not. And then I'm like, well, that's sort of irrelevant because we got problems now. Yeah. But well, hey, um, what are you supposed to do in the meantime? <laughs> right. We got to wait yeah. a thousand years for communism, but climate change is hitting us <laughs> today. Like, um, then we maybe need to think through this a little bit more. I mean. I admire people like um, like Henrik Grossman who do try to work out from hints and marks mathematical theories that are verifiable, falsifiable. And uh, for all that we like to point out that Henrik Grossman was wrong about the 1930s, it's actually weird how much he got right um, about the conditions of the specific profitability chains and all this. And he got it right, you know, five to six years before it happened um, and did come up with a mathematical model for it. The The problem that you had is the next step is, well, this means that the workers will revolt and there will be communism, which that's the leap. Yeah. It's like, that is the leap. Um, so, yeah. So I guess my last question for you after two hours and I'll let you have the rest of your evening. Thank you for coming on. Uh, it's why be a Marxist or be a scientist after after we have shattered so many of the way people think about this. Yeah, what's what's your defense of still engaging in this? <laughs> um, I think part of it is probably methodological in terms of actually understanding model construction, understanding falsification, um, it, both in terms of science and in terms of marks like I, I i really can't emphasize enough how much i think uh marxists need to understand how to develop models and actually reject models um yeah i mean we've we've painted a pretty gloomy picture over the last two hours um yeah, I mean, I mostly play grooming pictures. It's yeah, I was going to say, it's very on brand. <laughs> it's very it's very much my brand. I mean, the thing is, it would sound like we don't believe, like, I still consider myself a Marxist, even with everything I've said tonight. Yeah, same. Um, and it's not just normatively. I do think there are things I take from Marxism, methodologically, assumptions about how to model capitalism, what's important to look at. Yeah. Um. Uh, that I get from Marx and not a whole lot of other places, you know. This is exactly it. Like, uh, like for all his, like, I mean, the man's obviously an incredible thinker, but it's how he conceptualized his model of, like, the circuit of capital. Like, to actually, the actual 
act of doing that is like incredible i because i like I, I tried to think about that methodologically how he got at that and he discusses it in brief and others obviously have tried to get it as well but that is like that is where i think there are some huge lessons to be learned obviously there is like plenty of other stuff in terms of like which you can take forward but i think for just like on a personal level in terms of like what i find like inspiring or useful it's really that and i think that's kind of in a way um maybe a bit underappreciated right well here's what i always tell people we always hear about the modes of production he only lays it out twice actually he and Ingalls only lay it out twice both of which are practically footnotes um not that there aren't modes of production but like which ones we're talking about those are only mentioned twice and then you know uh the soviet union really builds them up but uh as periodizations, it didn't even seem like he was super attached to them. It's just what was available, right? So I don't find that interesting. But when you talk about the circuit of capital, when you talk about um, looking at aggregates uh, and then seeing, and then looking, for example, one thing I, I pull from Marx's class analysis, for example, is most class analysis are either based on legal categories, um, which he would say most societies classes priorly going to be based on legal categories are on informal social categories uh that are that you know initially are about surplus you know um but i will say as a person who studied anthropology the moment i started looking at surplus production a whole lot of stuff that never made any sense to me when i was studying you know historical peers like why did we develop governments at a certain time and not before that? Like, why was there an agricultural revolution? What's going to prompt that? Why did, Why does that always seem to be unequal? When, when the few times is it equal? What are conditions that make it so? Um, before I started looking at Marx and thinking about classes in terms of economic production and who could reproduce and why and how, um, and not just reproduce and just like access to sex and the like, darwinian sense but also uh reproduce their social position reproduce uh their technologies etc uh, there's a whole lot of things in in like anthropology to me that just seemed really fucking arbitrary like and when you when you started looking at the variables that marx looks at they're not arbitrary anymore um and then you start you have a clearer idea of what politics actually is um as opposed to like these aristotelian reified i mean like i love aristotle and marx is highly dependent on aristotle but let's not pretend that the last thing we can learn about human development was by you know a greek dude um 2400 years ago who uh i mean almost every biological thing aristotle wrote was wrong um uh and Frankly, Europe was set back like a thousand years by people insisting that Aristotle was right on things. Um, but also methodologically, there are some things that come out of Aristotle that are quite useful. Uh, also, I, I really like there's some projects and stuff like Nargajuna where you start dealing with like categories and, and non-negation and when the rule of contradiction doesn't apply and stuff like that. Uh, that's super useful. Am I a... Uh, do I think we should totally resurrect uh, like 2,100 year old uh, North Indian Nepalese mysticism? No. Like uh, my love of Buddhism aside, that's not really a useful uh, world. Like, you know, come on. I'm not going to argue that you need to get your information from Nagas who live at the bottom of the river, who give you uh, the secret Buddha texts that enable you to figure out logic. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I think, I mean, a lot of these comparisons seem unfair to people, but I don't think they're actually as unfair as they seem. Because I, I, I am like, why are we holding on to this 19th century stuff? And I guess some of it is because we, we see people who use this in bad faith. Like, there's a lot of people who want to reject the good stuff of Marx. who are like, well, our economy doesn't work like that anymore. I'm like, yeah, I mean, there are things in which it does. Like, yeah. like have you ever asked yourself, why poor countries don't have rentier economies the way rich countries do it's because they are commodity poor and you can't have a rentier economy unless you have these commodities that mark talks about like 
Um, because before that, I'm like, I didn't understand. What, like, like from a Keynesian perspective, for example, or from a modern monetary theorist perspective, there's no reason why Argentina can't be the United States in its currency. And when I think when you look at, even if you assume a lot of chart, neo-chartalism is true, when you start looking at the variables that Marx tells you to look at, it immediately becomes clear. Like, oh, they have productive power capacities and they can't force people to buy their stuff and take their currency. So they can't really, like their currency is hemmed in when in a way that ours is not, et cetera, et cetera. Like, um, can I truly falsify that model? No. Uh, but, but I can say it is probabilistically more likely with the data that we have than other explanations. For example, the explanation that, well, they make the political mistake to peg it to the dollar. And then I'm like, well, why does everyone make that mistake? Like, is it because they're dumb? That is not a viable uh, position unless you're like a secret racist or something. Uh, and I know most people who say that aren't, right? So, because I don't think they're racist, at least not more than anybody. Um, so then what's the actual explanation? You have to have a better one and you don't have one, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah. So yeah. for me, there's reason. there are things to salvage from Marxism. There's a reason to commit to be a not, to be like a Marxist, uh, both normatively and part of descriptively. But I think like resurrecting dialectical materialism, like from dialectics of nature is a foolhardy errant and you shouldn't do it. Like there are good insights in that book. Actually, I do think, you know, that book is interesting. It's insightful certain things, but it's, I don't know, man. I just, I don't think it's, uh, I think, and I think it's weird, actually, that that impulse has come back because we actually didn't have it for a long time. Like, I will say this. I wasn't arguing with people 30 years ago about, like, whether or not we should resurrect dialectics of nature as a biological text. That's a very recent thing. Why is that? I don't know. I mean, I w some of it is... Uh, the left opposition wasn't as concerned about it, and the left opposition was overrepresented in American understandings of communism for anti-communist reasons that weren't even in favor of the left opposition. I think that's partly true. I think painting it as proto lysenkoism was a thing, even in the academy. Um, uh, but why it came back, I don't know. Because I, I'm trying to imagine, like, in what way is that book really illuminating to anyone today? Mm -hmm. The only thing I can figure is that the the weird sec the sectarian groups that had the longevity to stay around uh, after the 1970s were the ones that like almost like with religious groups were the ones that required more insistence. And that they kind of would kept this for their cadres and then only started pushing it out to the public recently. Um, it's a slightly vulgar reach, but I guess you've got the reemergence of Kautsky as well. Yeah, yeah. There's that. I mean, I mean, I mean that. I'm going to wonder all day why. I mean, not that I don't think Kautsky is important, but like why. In 2012, um, a book from a, a book for, uh, by an Oxford Don, but not from a even published in like Lulu, um, uh, became so dominant on the Marxist left, except that I guess I don't know. I need. I would love to come up with a falsifiable theory of Marxist sectarian systems and the way it drives behavior, because I have intuitions there that I sometimes state as facts, but I'll be honest, they're just intuitions based off of observation. Like there seems to be um, like 2007 happened and people started taking economic leftism seriously. Again, the only organizations around were either, um, ML organizations, uh, largely attached to, to like rump existing communist parties in Latin America and Asia and Europe, or um, Trotskyist organizations who, through sheer force of sectarian will, had survived after 1992. 
and that all of like it took 20 years for the fact that most of their explanation for the Soviet Union was just no longer relevant. Um, and then people start looking for other things because there's also other weird emergences like like why why is Bordigism a very <laughs> strange minority tendency uh, so popular on the internet? Like uh, particularly around and I, I say this as a person who got sucked into it through end notes like everybody else did uh, and then started t- taking it seriously and then as I took it seriously it became like what about it? <laughs> But you know, why does that happen? Uh, I guess Borgadiga has got a little bit for everything, everyone. He's got for the left comms and for the vanguardists. Yep, I mean, well, I mean, <laughs> if you're a left com, but you really, really like Stalinist abstentionism and also like absolutely uh, contempt for anything democratic, uh, then I guess that's where you go. Uh, I know, you know, I know there are groups like the ICE, uh, the ICT who really try to combine uh, Kowskyism, I mean, not Kowskyism, Councilism with um, with Bordigism. But I've always felt like those those two tendencies were only linked by the fact they were shit on by Lenin in the same book, because like I'm like, I don't see other than their abstentionist on a lot of things. I don't see what they share at all. Like like uh, their orientations from like an orientation standpoint, their orientations are diametrically opposed. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, yeah, that's fun stuff. All right, I've been talking for a lot. So um, do you have any readings? Would you like people? I'm going to link the article that you sent me in the show notes. Um, yeah, uh, I do. I, I wasn't actually involved in that paper. It came out of my lab, um, though. Um, it's, yeah, it's. I think it's a, like, kind of sums up where... A lot of things are out at the moment. I think it's a really great read, uh, and as you said, it's not too too technical. So, yeah, I, I even like I said, I even understood the methodology section, which is usually the section in sciences I don't know where I'm like, meh. Like, and it's it's got that really nice. Uh, I don't know if it's figure one right at the end. It's this massive flow chart, which is just quite um, useful as well. It felt very cybernetic to me. I was like, ah, oh, flow charts. I'm used to well, you. This is it. This is exactly it. And this is kind of where it all links together for me. And I'm like, finally, some cohesion in everything in my life. <laughs> Are you also uh, weirdly obsessed with cybernetics? <laughs> yes, okay. absolutely. I I mean, I think some of the stuff you talked about in terms of trying to organize, like, both in terms of like, education and like in the way like um, actual organizations structure themselves cybernetically is like that's hugely important and so few people seem to give a shit no yeah my, my favorite thing to do with trotsky is that i was like why do you guys base your every one of you always base your organizations on the structure of the 1921 bolshevik constitution at, during the civil war you don't even go back to the 1917 bolshevik operating principles in the 1919 it's always 1921 now i have a question for you if you believe in historical materialism, why in the blue fuck would you pick the organizational form that led to Stalin? Yep. Like, and do it over and over and over again and insist on it when even if you're using Bolshevik models, there are other models to pull from. And this kind of sums up everything we were talking about earlier and why it applies to organization because you've got an inappropriate model, you've got a failure to falsify, and so the cycle continues. Yeah, yeah, and and I don't know, but th- this 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 methodology seems to produce one thing, and that is that is sexual assault scandals. Uh, and yet yeah, weird sectarian groups who don't change their leadership, even though they're ostensibly democratic. I'm just want to point out that since none of your groups ever change their leadership, and then when their leader dies, it it, it completely collapses, and yet. You're supposed to be the democratic ones of the Bolsheviks. I don't really understand how this works. Um, yeah, I mean, not to pick on Trotskyist. I mean, there's all tendencies on the left have fun shit like this. It's just that's the, that's like the obvious one. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think. Yeah, I think that's a good point to end on. Um, 
thank you so much, uh, Viv. I wanted you to have on the show for a while. I've I've, I've known that you've uh, talked to Esri quite a bit, and and um, I know that we share we share a lot of weird obsessions. Um, and obviously, as we've illustrated today, you're more knowledgeable about a lot of them than me. Um, but well, it's my wheelhouse. But yeah, yeah. It, well, you know, uh, come talk poetry. I'll 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 cut you. <laughs> yeah. Um, or or get me complaining about educational methodology and like why are there still a thousand papers a year written on you learning styles when they've been fucking debunked for three decades? I do not know. But I mean, uh, hearing hearing about that sort of stuff in like in a framework of cybernetics, I think would be extremely useful. Yeah, well, I have a friend uh, who was a diehard uh, dialectical Marxist, and then he discovered Stanford beer, and he became a diehard Stanford beerian. Um, he's been on my show before, so I mentioned his name is Mark Rainey. Uh, and Mark and I were discussing something and he was like, and I was like, look, a, you know, a lot of cybernetic concepts I think are useful, but there's like 85 ways to get to them. You don't have to use the cybernetic language. Um, but one of them that I think you're absolutely right, people don't study and it's a doom of Marxism is recursion and feedback loops. Yep. Um, and, and like figuring out feedback loops that are good versus feedback loops that are bad. And, and man, I, I really do believe there's some people addicted to stuff that we have plenty of evidence are bad feedback loops. Like, um, you know, Esri calls it cults. Uh, I don't use cult language because I think it's insulting to new religions. <laughs> um, uh, like don't insult cults. There, there are more interesting cults than our cult. No, um, no, <laughs> Sorry, being uncool there. But uh, I, I think of them as like a bunch of negative incentives and bad feedback loops. And I actually point out, for example, that uh, some of them happen in organizations that are aware of them and are trying. So you really have to think about how you set stuff up because like, what are you doing that prevents it from happening? And a lot of people, when I point this out, just say that I'm being vague. And I'm like, no, no, you have to think about incentives. The thing is, I can't tell you all the problems that are going to come up because there's no way for me to know. Like, you just have to have this framework and build from it and yeah. use it as a way to, like, spot check um, what are you incentivizing and what are you not incentivizing. Like, yeah, like, that, like it's a, almost like a Bayesian framework. Ultimately, you're, you're building things as you go. You're not you don't build like a static model and then that's it. It's a process. When I really want to lose my entire audience, Viv, I'm going to do the episode where I talk about uh, classical versus Bayesian, Bayesian <laughs> statistics and the controversies around that, because I am fascinated by it, but I'm sure that the moment I do that, that like my Patreon is going to drop to negative money. Like, <laughs> like. <laughs> like i'm pretty sure that's gonna this is like everyone will abandon me because i am officially the most weird boring person on the left because i am actually fucking fascinated with uh with with trying to figure out how which is the more mathematically valid um and historically valid way to approach historical statistics classical statistics or bayesianism and i can tell you that whatever book i'm reading and I'm not normally like this, but on this question, because maybe because I just don't, I, I'm, I don't know that it's answerable, um, or maybe it's I don't know if I can answer it. But uh, Bayesian statistics versus classical statistics, like whatever book I'm reading, I agree with that argument when I'm reading it. And then as soon as I'm done, I go back to whatever the other one was. So like, it's like whenever I read a book that convinced me that Bayesianism was wrong, I I find myself doing well. What are my Bayesian priors and what? probabilities they likely have yeah like, you like your probability distribution so i, I feel like really i know where you're gonna do. fall on this <laughs> i really like probability distributions but but i do also start thinking about well but if i what is the data set that i'm including in these probabilities and how did i construct that shit <laughs> yeah it gets complicated real fast yeah i think this is why uh I'm a media commentator and not a scientist anymore because my scientific inclinations are always just like, 
Yeah, but really prove it. But really prove it, though. But, like, I don't believe you. Really prove it. <laughs> That's why it's much easier to be like, we're not proving anything. We're disproving things. Yeah. 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 It was a good worker. Popper is a good workaround to Peronian skepticism, isn't it? Like, because uh, otherwise, it's like, oh, you can't prove anything, motherfucker. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, just believe what I believed in the first place. <laughs> Whatever is psychologically useful for me to believe. I, oh, yeah, and I'm gonna make Elaine Badu like roll over in his. I guess he's not dead yet, so his non-grave roll over in his French bed or whatever. All right. I really am going to end this. Thank you so much for coming on. No worries. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.